following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today we're going to continue the course that we started about practical spirituality. To remind you, in the first lecture we discussed some basic theoretical and structural information at the core of Hinduism, specifically in relation with yoga. And in that lecture, to remind you, we discussed how this word yoga is Sanskrit for union. It does not refer simply to postures for the physical body. The truth is that yoga refers to the union of our soul or our psyche with divinity. So all forms of yoga have this as their goal, which in Hinduism is called Atmayana. That term is usually translated to English as self-realization. But as we explained previously, the term really means knowledge of self. It refers to a type of knowledge that we've acquired through our experience, personally. So self-realization means that. It means to experience the reality of the self and to know that from experience. So that's the core message of real yoga. It's the core message of every genuine religion. And of course, it's the core of the Gnostic tradition. That word gnosis has the exact same implication. It means knowledge from experience. And we're not concerned with knowledge in a materialistic sense, a worldly sense, we're concerned with knowledge of the consciousness, knowledge of the soul, for the soul to have experiential knowledge. This is really our interest. So we've called this course Practical Spirituality to emphasize that that is what Atma Vidya, or Gnosis, really means. And we've given it the subtitle, The Yoga of Awakening. And this means the union of the awakening consciousness. And it's a union that occurs in many levels until that consciousness becomes a unity, singular, one, self-realized, full and complete of self-knowledge with absolute self-knowledge. This means knowledge of all the levels of the self. To have that is to be a Buddha, a God, to be like Krishna, Jesus, and these other great masters that we respect and follow. To be that type of soul, that type of entity, is to have experience of all the levels of the self. To know oneself from the very depths to the height of heights. So that's more or less what we discussed in the first lecture. And today we're going to go deeper into this subject. Our concern really in this tradition, even though we talk about a lot of complicated things and sophisticated things, and we explain many mythologies and religions 
and hierarchies and scriptures, really the point of it is to emphasize for us, to underscore for us, that there is a single path, and that path is inside of us. And that path has to be walked here and now by knowing who we are and by learning to change. So all the theory and all the, the diagrams and all the explanations are useful and they have their place. But they are completely meaningless if we aren't actually working from moment to moment to awaken, to know for ourselves who we truly are. So this course, we're focusing specifically on that. How do we do that? How do we acquire facts? Throughout all the books and courses, we present, we present a lot of theories, a lot of structures, diagrams, explanations, a lot of words, a lot of definitions. But none of that is factual until we ourselves have confirmed it and experienced it and know it. So that is our primary need. And this is underscored by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. He says in this book while teaching Arjuna, even if one of the most even if one is the most sinful of all sinners, one shall yet cross over the ocean of sin by the raft of self-knowledge alone. As the blazing fire reduces wood to ashes, similarly, the fire of self-knowledge reduces all bonds of karma to ashes. This is an incredibly empowering statement. And it's very important to truly, deeply understand what it's telling us. It isn't telling us that by believing in Krishna, we will be saved. It isn't telling us that by belonging to some group that worships, worships Krishna that we will be saved. It's not telling us to make a pledge or an oath. It's not telling us to make a donation, to change the way we dress, the way we talk. It's telling us that by knowing ourselves completely, deeply, fully, entirely, we can become liberated from suffering. Even if we are the most sinful of all sinners, liberation is 100% a result of our own work to know ourselves. It isn't the work of any being outside of us. No one is liberated by anyone else. We are liberated by ourselves. This is an empowering phrase. It should be inspiring to us because it tells us by knowing ourselves fully and completely, we become free from karma, free from being bound to suffering of all types, simply by knowing ourselves in depth. Now, this really is the same teaching that you find from every great master. Jesus taught the same thing in his own words. But of course, the religions lose sight of the practical nature of the teaching and just want people to believe, to follow. But that's not the real teaching. Now that line, that quote, comes from the Bhagavad Gita, which is an excerpt of a longer scripture called the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is a very beautiful, and very profound story that represents the spiritual work that each of us has to perform inside of ourselves. And the Bhagavad Gita, which means the song of the Lord, is an accounting of a teaching that Krishna gives to Arjuna. Krishna represents the light of the Christ, the universal solar force that is at the heart of every illuminated master. It is the fire of life. It is the fire of beingness. Krishna is an incarnation of that, just like Jesus is an incarnation of that. 
And this story, the Bhagavad Gita, occurs at the moment of a great battle. Arjuna is the warrior, the archer, who has to ride into battle against his own kin. All of his family, all of his relatives, are all gathered on a battlefield, which is depicted in this image. And he sees them all, all of these people that he respects and feels bound to, he falters. He has doubt. He suddenly realizes he doesn't have it in him to kill these people that he has known for so long. And he doubts himself, and he doubts his purpose, and he doubts what he's doing there. And he's quivering with uncertainty. And this is where this Bhagavad Gita begins. Krishna, who's driving his chariot, gives him a spiritual talk. And that is the entirety of the Bhagavad Gita, is this talk. This image is symbolic. Many people read the story and, and love the images and the depiction of the story because it's exciting and it's interesting and they treat it like any sort of other mythology or tale. But really, this represents a state of consciousness, a level of being, an aspect of spiritual work. Arjuna represents our soul, specifically the human soul, which in Kabbalah is related with Tiferet. Krishna represents the Christ, specifically Hokmah, Vishnu, who incarnates in the world, incarnates in us to guide us on the path. And this moment is related to a specific stage of initiation where the initiate has to face against the entirety of their psyche, their own mind. Facing that great battle and knowing that it is their duty to kill all of their beloved habits, ways of thinking, ways of feeling, ways of behaving, to eliminate them because they are the obstacles that prevent us from being one with divinity. This is why he falters. These are my beloved relatives. These are the ones I've always known, the ones who've always been by my side. How can I possibly eliminate them? They are my very identity. They are my kin. This is Arjuna's fear, his hesitation. The chariot represents the soul. Tifret. The horses have multiple levels of significance. Primarily, they relate to the bodies of the soul. They also relate to the senses. The important thing here is that every student of mysticism and religion goes through this crisis again and again, doubting the work, being unwilling to really face the things in ourselves that keep us in bondage. We forget that teaching of Krishna that says, through the fire of self-knowledge, we can burn that which binds us. If we but know what is binding us. So this teaching on the battlefield is about self-knowledge, about Arjuna facing himself and being willing to conquer himself. And the whole Bhagavad Gita is an explanation of how to do it. So that is represented in the Tree of Life in this way. When we study the Tree of Life from Kabbalah, we're looking at a diagram, symbolic representation of our own self. We often talk about it in relation with external worlds. But really, its primary significance is that it represents our internal worlds, who we are but we don't know it. In simple terms, we see at the very top, we see the ultimate non-beingness, the prakriti, shunyata, the emptiness, the void. It has many names and many traditions. Here we can call it Brahma in Hindu terms. In Buddhist terms, we can call it Adi Buddha, Samantabhadra. The middle part, which has 10 spheres, would be the heavens. 
And the bottommost one of those ten is the physical body or the physical world. And below that are the hells, Avicii. Psychologically speaking, our physicality houses all of this. Everything that we experience psychologically is mapped on this tree. This is our duty when we begin the spiritual path to identify our psychological experiences and know them for what they are. Through that self-knowledge, we start to burn the karma. This isn't theoretical. It's something that happens in moment-to-moment experience through observation, through managing energy. These aspects of self, in very simple terms, are our, our inner divinity, which in the Bhagavad Gita is represented by Krishna. Then we have our humanity, which in the Bhagavad Gita is represented by Arjuna. And then we have our impurity, which is represented by all of the warring factions on the battlefield. You see, our inner divinity is not in conflict. We are in conflict. Krishna is there in the battlefield helping Arjuna, but he is not part of the battle. He is content, serene, happy. He isn't in conflict. He isn't having doubt. He isn't afraid. He sees things for what they are. Arjuna is scared, afraid, worried, confused. He is that humanity that we have that is caught between divinity and impurity, the way we are. There's a difference, though, between us and Arjuna. Arjuna is talking face-to-face with God. Have we? Most people hear that question and think, it's impossible. No one can talk to God. But that isn't true. In every scripture of every religion in the world, the initiates talk to divinity. Without exception. And if following a religion, our goal is to become an example of that religion, should we not also expect to be able to talk to divinity? Of course we should expect that. It's logical. So if we have not talked to divinity, why? That is not the fault of God, because God is always there in us, always. The responsibility falls on us. Perhaps the reason is because our attention has been completely absorbed by our impurity, and we have not managed to free it to turn and look the other direction and see divinity. Doesn't that make the most logical sense to explain this issue? It does to me, especially having observed my mind, knowing the impurities that are in my mind. This makes common sense. And all the ones who've experienced divinity explain it in that way as well. They say by changing bad habits and adopting good habits, we start to experience the truth. Reality. This is what the previous lecture was all about. The first two steps of yoga, yama and niyama. Avoidances and precepts. Things not to do and things to do. If we follow just the first two steps of the Ashtanga yoga path, the Eightfold Path, we will begin to experience divinity. This is just how cause and effect works. There's nothing magical about that, scientific. 
You see, on the tree of life, if we observe this structure, we see the heavens and the more subtle levels above the physical body. And below it, we see what are classically symbolized as demons or sins, which in Hinduism have uh, various ways of approaching and understanding them, like samskaras, klishas, vasanas, etc. In the West, we call it subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness, defects, egos, aggregates, many terms for these elements in ourselves that in simple terms we can call pride, anger, lust, envy, fear, gluttony, greed, avarice, and the list goes on. We're filled with these qualities, constantly at battle with these qualities or constantly enslaved by them. This is why we don't see divinity. We're never free of the cage that we made for ourselves. Yoga is about freeing ourselves from the cage by knowing the cage, observing the cage, and learning about it so that we can get out of it. That is what real yoga is about. So that is why the first four lines of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali state, now instruction in union. Union is the suppression of the modifications of mind stuff. Then the seer dwells in her own nature. Otherwise, she is of the same form as those modifications. As we explained in the previous lecture, the Yoga Sutras are regarded as the core text of yoga in terms of a practical text. They're not really that old. Uh, scholars disagree on their age, but the teachings that they encode are very old. These are the first four lines of the Yoga Sutras. They set up the entire scripture. First line, now instruction in union. Now this phrase in Sanskrit, many times if you look at translations, they say, now after being prepared, instruction in yoga. So this text was not given publicly. Nowadays, it's easy to get it and read it. But it was really designed for students who had already been prepared to put it into practical work. It wasn't something for debate or discussion or light reading, you know, at night when you're eating your meal and you just want to read something like a newspaper. This is not what the scripture is for. The second line says, union is the suppression of the modifications of mind stuff. These terms are quite specific. Union, of course, is yoga. So this phrase is defining what real yoga is. Modifications in Sanskrit is vrittis. This word is subtle. We're going to talk more about it. Mind stuff is the word chitta. If you know the term bodhicitta, it is part of that important word. Chitta loosely can mean mind. So let's, let's apply this to our experience now. How can we understand this now? Yoga is the suppression of modifications of mind. Meaning, you can experience yoga right now if you can extract consciousness from how it is being modified, conditioned. That is the only limitation. It's in completely psychological action. It's an action of attention. If you can succeed in doing that, extracting consciousness, self, from modifications in the psyche, in the mind, then, line three, then the seer dwells in her own nature. Now, this word seer in the Sanskrit is actually a masculine word, but in this presentation of the explanation, I put it feminine because I want to relate it to this image of Krishna with the gopis. This is a very popular image in Hinduism. Krishna surrounded by 
all the village girls who are all very devoted to him and very much in love with him. And sadly, most people don't realize the symbolic importance of that image. It's become just a cultural image and something that people take at face value. But it has a very deep significance. Krishna represents the universal deity in all life. That compassionate, intelligent wisdom that descends into the world to guide souls to liberation. Krishna is that universal compassion. The gopis, the village girls, represent all of the beings who long for that liberation. And they feel so much devotion and gratitude towards Krishna for that. That is what the symbol represents. Most people think it's the girls have a crush on him because he's so handsome. So they're always following him around and trying to have dances and play games and chase each other through the fields. That's not what it means. It's symbolic of how your own inner divinity longs to be in the presence of Krishna, the ultimate divinity. It's a very beautiful, subtle image. And if we as the soul, as Arjuna, can taste that in our hearts, that is bhakti yoga. That is devotional yoga. It is that longing for union. That is the experience of the seer dwelling in her own nature. Because our own nature, our true nature, is not in conflict. It is not in pain. Our true nature is a perfect serenity, a brilliant intelligence, a radiating love that is unconditioned and unblemished. And every living thing has that as its true nature. But that light has become conditioned by bad habits, what we call karma. Really, that just means the effects of mistaken actions. Because we've made so many mistaken actions, we have conditioned the mind with layer upon layer of the results of our anger and pride and lust and greed and gluttony, etc. And that's why we can't easily experience our own nature. And that is why line four says, otherwise she is of the same form as the modifications. When we observe ourselves now, we see the truth of that. We experience ourselves as the form of our mind. When we are angry, we truly feel that we are nothing but anger. When we are afraid, we truly feel we are nothing but that. There is no God, there is no divinity, there is no hope, there is only fear. We become the modification. But that's a lie. We are not that. That's why we need to learn yoga. We are instead identified with a modification. Avriti. So the next two lines of the scripture state the modifications are five, some painful and some not painful. And those five are right knowledge, wrong knowledge, fantasy, sleep, and memory. Vritis, loosely translated, means thought wave. Observe your thoughts and notice that they come in waves. They just rise, sustain, and pass. Rise, sustain, and pass. Seemingly coming from nowhere, seemingly sustained by nothing, and seemingly dissolving to nowhere. Those are vrittis, waves on the waters of the mind. 
And as it explains here, some of those are painful and some are not. The problem is we mistakenly think we are the waves. We think that those thoughts and feelings that are flowing through the mind from moment to moment constitute the self. So we are always thinking, I am hungry. I feel despair. I am angry. I want to go outside. I want to go inside. I am cold. I am hot. I am old. I am young. I, I, I. This constant process of I am, and then put in quotes, this feeling, this sensation, this thought. End quote. But all of that is a mistaken perception. These are just waves that come and go. They have no inherent reality. When you truly start to learn how to meditate, this is one of the first things that you discover. That as you work on learning to meditate, and you start to observe that the mind is just projecting continuously, and it seems to come from no place and go to no place, and none of it seems to have any real importance or meaning. It's like a child who won't stop talking. You know when kids are that age, some kids, and they just talk nonstop, and everything that comes out of their mouth is uttered nonsense? And running around and just talk, 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 talk. And our mind is like that. The problem is we don't see it. We become hypnotized by it, and we think it is our self. But it is not. It's just waves on the waters of the mind. Now, these five specifically have importance. The first two are right knowledge and wrong knowledge. Again, these are waves on the mind. They are modifications. Right knowledge is direct perception or inference or testimony. Wrong knowledge is false perception whose real form is not seen. Now, without exception, all of us think that what we think is right knowledge. None of us have any doubts that what we think and believe could possibly be wrong. And this is our first and most tremendous mistake. So we'll come back to that. Let's first look at wrong knowledge. Wrong knowledge is false perception. So the example that's often given in Asian philosophy is how we can easily, while walking, suddenly think we see a snake and we have that moment of terror before we realize it's just a coiled rope. And we all do this sort of misperception. That's what these two images represent. And it has to do with how sensations are interpreted and translated by the psyche. Now, this example, it's a very simple example. And in some way, you could say it's superficial. But it serves to illustrate a problem that we have all the time, 24 hours a day, which is that we do not know how to correctly perceive. We assume that the way that our mind translates information is always accurate. But the fact is that it is never accurate. And the interesting thing is that materialistic science is proving that now. The physicists who are studying phenomena in nature are now proving that our perceptions lie. And those scientists and doctors who are studying the brain, the consciousness, the senses, and quantum mechanics, and all of these other very interesting scientific things are proving that all of us are the most insatiable liars 
to ourselves. And yet humanity just doesn't get it. Even though religion's been saying it for thousands of years, and the mystical traditions have been saying it, now the scientists are saying it too, and still we don't believe it. We can't conceive that we could possibly be wrong in how we perceive things. But we don't see things accurately. False perception does not imply merely through your eyeballs. It implies how you as a psyche perceive all things. And the most significant type of perception that causes suffering is entirely in your mind. It is how you think and feel. To give an example, two friends, best friends, have a conversation where both misunderstand what was being said. And this causes both of them individually to generate negative feelings towards the other. And then the, suddenly the, the best friendship is in doubt. Don't we all experience that? All the time? Yet we still don't recognize the problem is not with the spouse or the friend. The problem is in our mind. Because we constantly reflect on that thing that was said, and then the mind extrapolates. It starts adding to it. Well, he said this, and I think, I know he meant this and this and this and this also. And I know that his intention is this and this and this. And so we start adding lots and lots of interpretations and added meanings. But where does all that come from? Who's interjecting all that information into that event? Is it based on any facts? No, never. It's all projections of the mind. It's all modifications, false perceptions, whose real form is not seen. We aren't seeing the soul the heart, the mind of the other person. We're only seeing the projections of our own mind. And yet we believe it. Not knowing where it came from, not knowing what it's about, not questioning its reality. So wrong knowledge is a painful modification. And it's the one that we experience for most of our lives. Right knowledge is direct perception. Something that we've seen and can confirm for ourselves is true. Now, chief among these, of course, to us, would be to have right knowledge of divinity, to have experienced God. But since most of us have not had that experience, we don't have right knowledge about divinity. We have wrong knowledge. We have false perceptions. We have fantasies. God must be like this. God must be like that. Or I don't believe in God or God isn't real. All of that is wrong knowledge. They may be beautiful beliefs. They may be beautiful theories that we have, but none of it is based on experience. Right knowledge is direct perception. Nevertheless, right knowledge, pramana in Sanskrit, is a modification of mind. It is not the thing itself. As a way by, by way of explanation for some of you who may be questioning how this could possibly be, someone who is self-realized doesn't have modifications. Read these. The mind is liberated. They don't need right knowledge. They don't need pramana because they are that. It's as if it's the same as saying that the flame needs to know that it is a flame. It doesn't. It is the flame. It is that. It doesn't need to think that. Does that make sense? There's a difference between having 
a thought of something or a mental idea of something to being the thing itself. That's the distinction. Right knowledge, pramana, is a modification of mind. It is a way of thought. It is a way of, of interpreting information. It may be accurate, but it is still an interpretation. It isn't the thing itself. Pramana, right knowledge, is an interpretation. But it is based on a direct perception or an inference or a testimony. Now, direct perception is easy to understand. It's something that we've seen ourselves, experienced ourselves. So we know for ourselves that it's true. Spiritually speaking, most students have none of that about spirituality. This is actually an important thing to realize. Don't lie to yourself. If you don't have right knowledge, direct perception, admit it. Don't lie to yourself and convince yourself or others that you do. Because you condemn yourselves to never acquire it. Be honest. If you've never been out of your body, if you've never talked face to face with your own innermost, your divine mother, or an angel, or a guru deva, good, admit it. Now work to have it, because you can. But don't lie to yourself or others, mostly to yourself. Be honest. We need direct perception. But if we're lying to ourselves with a false perception, we will never have the real one. Inference, from right knowledge, is a way of knowing something is true because you have sufficient facts to support that knowledge. A simple example, materialistically, would be if you see smoke, you know there's a fire. Simple. In the same way, when you observe yourself, if you observe a negative emotion, a bad mood, you know that is not God. That is an ego, a defect. That's how you know something directly by inference. When you see that you're stressed, tense, that is not divinity producing that in you. That is a conflict in your psyche between a desire and reality. That's all stress is. You want something you don't have. Conflict causes stress, physically, emotionally, mentally. When you deal with the desire, when you recognize the desire and you disempower the desire, the stress goes away. It's really simple. That's inference. Knowing something by the evidence that surrounds it. Testimony is knowing something by a reputable source. What do we consider a reputable source? Well, someone or something that does have right knowledge or that is an awakened master, a fully developed being. We are very strict on this point in this tradition. Exceptionally strict. And it's because we value the soul of every person. We consider valid testimony to be the teachings of the greatest masters. Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, Moses, Abraham, Quetzalcoatl, Padmasambhava, Milarepa, the Dalai Lamas, all these type of teachers that are at the very pinnacle of development. That's what we consider Valid testimony. Teachers who fully, fully exemplify what the teachings are guiding us to be. We don't accept those who are halfway. Because they don't know everything. We're very strict on that point. So yes, there are many popular books about spirituality in the bookstores. So what? What? We're not interested in what's popular. We're interested in the welfare of your very soul. Can you afford to take a risk on someone who might be mistaken? In my opinion, no. In my opinion, suffering is such a vibrant reality 
and the potential for mistake is so prevalent that you have to be extraordinarily strict with yourself what teachings you ingest and believe and follow and act on. Someone may have the best intentions in the world, but be completely wrong. This is why we rely on Jesus, Buddha, Moses, these very high masters. And that's what we consider valid testimony. Now, we need to analyze these things in ourselves on a day-to-day basis. This is why we point them out. The next modifications are vikalpa, nidra, and smriti. Of course, these are Sanskrit words. Fantasy, sleep, and memory. Fantasy follows mere words that have no basis in reality. Sleep is a modification of mind based on abhava. And memory is not allowing impressions to escape. Fantasy. The scripture says that fantasy follows mere words that have no basis in reality. This characterizes a huge percentage of the contents of our mind. An enormous majority of what is in our mind is absolute fantasy and based on nothing. This includes not only all the TV shows and movies and celebrities and politics and all the things that we ingest from the media, all of that is utter fantasy. I know we take it very seriously that movies are very important and that celebrities are important and our TV shows are important, but it is all lies based on nothing. It has absolutely no importance in relation with the soul. It is a type of witchcraft, if you will, or black magic. It's a hypnotic impulse or a hypnotic influence. We watch these actors, we watch these movies and stories, we watch these celebrities, and all they're doing is lying, projecting themselves to be something that they are not. And what is worse, we believe it, and then we, we uh, imitate it. Haven't you noticed that when you watch something that you're really into, you start to imitate the actor? Maybe in the way you stand, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you dress, the words you use, the way you look around, you think, maybe I'm looking like this guy now. (laughs) We all do that. It is a consequence of being hypnotized. We watch that band that we think is so cool, And we start dressing like them, acting like them, thinking like them, that music running through our heads all the time. That is a form of hypnosis. That is fantasy. We follow a particular fashion or a particular culture or a particular political movement or any type of teaching or theory or doctrine that wants us to affirm that we are such and such a way, we are born again, or we are of the chosen ones. All of that is fantasy. Because not one atom of it can be confirmed through direct perception. Not a single particle. It is all just words. Beliefs. Nothing. That's fantasy. And you see that our culture is completely and utterly hypnotized by it. Because when we point it out, people get mad. People get angry. Well, that's my band, or that's my show, or that's my style. How dare you contradict that? We, teach, we think it's something sacred. We don't realize that it is utterly and completely meaningless. Like images in a mirror, there's nothing there. But that's the nature of our culture now. Sleep is a vritti, a modification, based on abhava. Now, this term, abhava, is really significant. I'm sure all of you have memorized the course we gave on bhava chakra. So you know very well what bhava means. But some of you may not, so I'm going to remind you. Bhava means mind, being, becoming. 
reality. It is one state. It can imply many things. So abhava is to not be. To lack being. So you could say that this word would be nothingness or emptiness, something like that. But I didn't use that in this translation. Because we hear the word nothingness or emptiness and we think of the absolute. And many people misinterpret this passage because of that. And that's wrong. The Sanskrit word is abhava. It is the opposite of bhava. It is to lack bhava. Bhava is a very significant word in Asian philosophy. The whole point of spirituality is to become. It is to create a real human being, to become perfect. That is bhava, to be. That's why we use the word being for our ultimate nature. We talk about our being, experiencing our being. It implies divinity, but it also implies being here and now. Sleep is to not be here and now. It is to be utterly and completely hypnotized, distracted. And that's our state all day and all night. Don't believe me? Someone who is being is perceiving accurately and is conscious of what they perceive. When you are conscious of what you perceive, you remember it. Remember that car accident you were in and suddenly you were shocked and you became very aware of everything that you saw and you can remember every little detail of that experience? Maybe it was a car accident or you almost run over by a bus or some other shocking thing that happened that really woke you up. That was an experience of being, really perceiving the moment. Now tell me, six weeks ago today, where were you and what were you doing in this moment? Okay, yesterday, Friday, six weeks ago, at this time, where were you and what were you doing? Don't tell me, oh, I must have been at work, or I must have been having lunch, or I must, no, no, no. Tell me what you perceived. Let's make it easier. 72 hours ago, tell me exactly what you were doing. We can't. Okay, let's make it easier. 10 hours ago. No one can remember because we are not being. We aren't awake, we're asleep. When you're awake, you remember. What about four hours ago? You start maybe a little more information four hours ago. You might be able to piece together a couple of little memories I think I was, I think I was in this place. That's how weak the consciousness is in us. But when you start to really develop the consciousness, you can remember everything. Now this sleep is significant in this regard because when you really start to awaken in the moment from moment to moment, even when your physical body is asleep, your consciousness is not. You will remember all of your dreams. And yes, you dream. Many people say, I never dream. You do. You just don't remember. All of us dream all night long. Through the process of learning to become, to be in the moment, you will remember everything. Little by little. So the third here is, or the fifth rather, is memory. And that is not allowing impressions to escape. You notice how things just keep repeating in your mind? You're in the grocery store and they were playing that annoying song and now it's stuck in there. Or for some reason, that person you saw on the train, you just keep remembering. Some reason that memory just keeps coming in your mind. Or something someone said and it just keeps repeating and repeating. That is this tendency of these vrittis or modifications of mind to repeat. It's a, it's a sort of psychological indigestion. It's where impressions get stuck and they just recycle because we did not consciously transform it. 
Now, this region where impressions are most accessible to us, that we call memory, is really uh, doesn't have much capacity. It's like a small little Tupperware bowl. And all day long, we're constantly pouring new impressions in there from everything that we do and everything we think. So there's stuff just always circulating in there, but we, we don't really control what that is. And that's why when we sit and reflect and try to meditate and we look, there's just this weird stuff that's in indigestion. Like when you have an upset stomach and you feel like you're not digesting your meal, it's the same thing but in your mind. We have a constant state of psychological indigestion. That is this vritti, memory. Now, we point these things out because we can change them. This is the significant point. In the first lecture, we explained that yoga union is a very sophisticated science. And it has the ability, inherently, to take us all the way to complete development, full self-knowledge, completely self-realized, like Krishna or like Buddha. We can become that. It is not inconceivable. It can be done. It's been done before. It will be done again. Why not by us? The only thing that stops us is our own will. So in this tradition, we, we want to emphasize how to be practical and work with our will now, today. Not put it off for later, but to take advantage of our current circumstances and transform them as a vehicle for self-knowledge. So Krishna in the scripture explains four aspects of yoga. The first he explains is karma yoga. This is the path of work. Really, this path is about how to act in all ways, how to perform action. And the Bhagavad Gita, in my opinion, is the most beautiful scripture in the world that explains how one should act. And I really encourage you to study it. It's incredibly beautiful. In synthesis, what he explains is, learn to perform every moment as a devotional act towards me, divinity. On every level, everything that you do, from the most distasteful things and uncomfortable things to the things that you most want to do, do all of them the same way, as an act of devotion, without attachment to the results of the action, but just to do it from love. Now, if we were to adopt that attitude, it means that we would go to work, not hating work, not hating all of our coworkers, not dragging our feet and resenting everyone, but we would go there with this sense of, this urgency, this inspiration of now I have a chance to go and serve divinity. Just put yourself in that perspective for a moment. What if your inner God, your inner father, your inner divine mother came to you and said, today I want you to come to work and everything you do at work, do it because you love me. Wouldn't you be thrilled to do that? To go to your terrible job that you hate, but do it because you love God? Imagine how different your experience of that job would be. You actually might start to really like it. All those annoying customers you have to deal with and annoying coworkers, you actually might start to see the beauty in them, the humanity in them, the fragility, and do something good for them. That is karma yoga. And that is to work with your three brains with that sense of devotion and responsibility to others. That's why the second path is bhakti yoga, the path of devotion. Krishna explains that you really can't separate all these paths. But we talk about them individually in order to clarify it for our weak minds to understand. The path of devotion really is to do that 
devotional approach in all things, in all ways, at all times. But it's deeper. It's to constantly have a prayer in your heart. This means that when you're having an argument with your friend, you can't become anger. Instead, you are praying. Imagine how transformative that would be. Instead of being in conflict, instead of being in pain, one could be in prayer. Wouldn't that change every situation that we experience? The third is jnana yoga, the path of self-analysis and knowledge. Now, really, this refers to that vritti of right knowledge, pramana, to really see things for what they are. But more than that, it is to be intellectually aware and to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. It is to be able to see oneself and understand what one sees. For example, we teach self-observation, which is really all this is how to observe oneself. But your self-observation is a lot more penetrating when you know that your thoughts are related to your intellectual brain. When you know that intellectually, you're able to observe yourself with more accuracy. When you know that your emotions are related with your emotional brain, related with your heart, you can observe yourself with more accuracy. That is dhyana yoga. And when you know how the things that you observe in yourself relate to the scriptures. That is jnana yoga. When you can identify this emotion that I'm feeling, what is it? Ah, oh, it's anger. And anger is a defect and it causes suffering. And I know that because I've studied the scripture. That is jnana yoga. That is analysis. It isn't to go and make big complicated diagrams of all of your defects. That's a waste of time. Jnana yoga is to be in the moment present ready to understand what you see and experience. The fourth is Raja Yoga, the royal path. And that is how we unify all of this through meditation. Ultimately, that's what this course is headed toward, is to explain that. So we explained in the previous lecture these steps of yoga. The ones I want to emphasize today are the first three. Yama, Niyama, and Asana. To really make your spirituality practical, to really acquire right knowledge of divinity, of reality, these are the only three you need to perfect. There are many other steps in the path of yoga and you will work with all of them. But these three will radically change your self-knowledge. And that's why in, the, in most of the real yoga schools, all the new students who come, that's all they learn, these three. And that's why all the people nowadays think yoga is easy and superficial. They learn these three, but they never learned how to use them properly, and they never learn that they lead to other things. So people get bored and they leave and go elsewhere. That's really why. People think, oh, I don't need to learn ethics, self-restraint. I don't need to learn these precepts or how to do these poses and postures. That's boring. I want to go have samadhi. And I want to skip this. That's how most people approach religion. They don't want to learn the Ten Commandments. They don't want to learn the, the precepts and the vows, and they don't want to stop drinking and smoking and sleeping around. We want to keep our vices and have the experiences of God, and that's impossible. It's trying to walk in two directions at the same time. You can't. You can only walk in one direction at a time, physically and spiritually. You can't go two directions at once. Physics doesn't allow it on any level. So, learning these three are the most important. If you learn them, all of the rest of these happen on their own. All of them. They happen on their own. Now, you, this contradicts what most students think about spirituality. They think, 
well, I've been studying Gnosis, and I, I know the things I'm not supposed to do, and I know the things I'm supposed to do, and I'm trying to be relaxed, and I'm doing pranayamas, but I can't meditate. I try and I try, but I can't have any experiences in meditation. That statement reveals the very problem of that student. They are ignoring the first three steps. They think they're doing them, but that is a wrong knowledge. They are not. Because if they are performing the first three steps, the rest are easy. Easy, no effort. So we hear students constantly coming to us, the instructors, and complaining. I'm doing all of this stuff, and I'm trying to meditate one or two hours a day, and I'm just not experiencing anything. This teaching doesn't work. The problem is not the teaching. The teaching is ancient. It's proven. It works. The problem is the mind. The problem is that the student is not being honest with themselves. They are skipping, usually, the first step. Usually, they're not even performing yama, self-restraint. Usually, they are still fornicating. They are lying to themselves and others. They are stealing from themselves and others. They are still acting the same way, psychologically and physically, that they always have. They aren't changing. And that's why nothing else happens. It's very simple. On the other hand, we observe students who become very focused on just that first step, yama. Very focused just on that. And for them, Meditation happens easily. Simple. No effort. So if you want to understand where you are in your spiritual work, study yourself in relation with especially the first two stages. Especially those. From moment to moment, from day to day. Here they are. Yama, to remind you, starts with ahimsa. This means to not harm anyone, including yourself. This means physically and psychologically. This means to show compassion and kindness at all times to everyone, even people who you think don't deserve it. That is the very first step of yoga. And how many people do it? How many of us are really sincere and honest about trying to become an incarnation of ahimsa? If you can only do one thing that yoga teaches, do that. If that is the only thing out of the entirety of the teachings you can accomplish, you have worked a miracle. Don't worry about all the complicated things, the theories and the symbols and the meanings and the what about this and what about that, all of the complexities of the teaching. Set it aside. It doesn't change you. What changes you is these steps. Learning to live ahimsa. Learning to live satyam, truthfulness. Asteya, to not steal. Brahmacharya, to be chaste. Parigraha to be a renunciate. If you can do those, there is no doubt you can become a Buddha. No doubt. These are the basis of being an angel. If you want to be an angel, master these. Start now. And accompanying them are Niyama. Saucha, which is Purity and cleanliness, not just physically, but externally. I mean internally, not just physically, but to be pure in your mind. When you find an impure thought, be aware of it. And overcome it. Replace it with something pure. Don't allow yourself to dwell in impure things. That includes all the impressions you take into yourself through the shows you watch, the people you talk to, the places you go, all of the impressions you take into your psyche, change your psyche. 
If you're watching garbage on TV, you are filling yourself with that garbage and you will have to deal with it later. It will be in you. It's better not even put it in there. Why create a problem you have to deal with later? Deal with it now. Don't take it in. It'd be like saying, oh, but you know, this guy is, he's an interesting guy. So I'm going to let him in my house. And so you let in all these people off the street carrying bags and bags of garbage and you let them come in and dump it all over your house. It's the same thing you're doing in your mind when you watch garbage. You're letting those degenerated elements come into your mind and dump garbage everywhere. Same. Santosha, contentment, satisfaction. Be content with what you have. Tapas, penance. Be happy to pay what you owe. We all have debts. Pay them with happiness. When you have experience, when you're having difficulties, when you're having ordeals, receive them happily because they are how you are paying what you owe. That's tapas. Svadaya, the study of religious books and repetition of mantras. Every day we should be doing this. Ishvara pranidana. This is to remember oneself, remember one's being at all times, in all places. To always be aware that with you, in you, is your divine mother, your being. Anyone who is accomplishing these 10 things every day rapidly experiences divinity, rapidly experiences the truth, rapidly acquires a huge amount of self-knowledge and meditation becomes very easy. Their path is accelerated rapidly. They don't need chemicals, drugs to go to other countries to try to escape from their circumstances. They don't need to search around for different teachers or read tens of thousands of books. They don't need any of that because the self-knowledge of seeing how they are in relation with these 10 things transforms them radically every day. We don't need to go to India or Mexico. We don't need to go find some teacher someplace who's going to tell us how we are. We see ourselves as we are now in relation with these 10 things. That inflames your self-knowledge. That flame is what burns your karma up. When you're really acting from ahimsa, you're not acting out of anger. You're transforming situations where you would be angry into situations that benefit everyone. You pay debts, you pay karma, you help others. Doesn't it make sense? It's logical. It's simple. That's why we repeat, Gnosis is lived upon facts, withers away in abstractions and is difficult to find in even the noblest of thoughts. What this statement is saying in essence is that we don't find Gnosis in any of the vrittis, the modifications. We only find it being here and now and dealing with facts. So let's deal with facts. Step two of this course, be honest with yourself. This is your practical exercise. I expect everyone here to now be honest with yourself from now on. No exceptions. Carry with you this inquiry. Is this what I'm observing in myself really me? Is it really myself, my being? Is this bhava or abhava? It is to have a question. And it is not an intellectual question. It is a conscious one. You have to become like a detective who's looking for facts. And the thing is, you're not dealing with a single thief, a single murderer, a single liar, but a horde of them. And you, as the soul, as Arjuna, have to face the battlefield, which is your own mind, your own life, your circumstances. This is why it's necessary to remember Krishna, your inner Krishna, that your inner divinity is there with you, always. When you face difficulties, remember 
and stimulate that devotion in your heart to give you strength. And observe yourself. Is this myself? When you're in real self-remembering and you feel that devotion, you will know the answer. Yes, it is. When you feel the activation of your consciousness in the moment, you will know it. And you will realize this is what living is for. It is to be. Not to be in the future or be in the past, but to be now. And to be clarifying and learning about oneself. So, if you can do that, you can now begin a very rich and promising exercise, which is to use a spiritual diary. Do you take one of these and pass it? This exercise is designed to inspire you to observe yourself objectively and to become responsible to answer for each day to yourself. This page lists a series of questions that you can answer at different stages of your day. The first set is for the morning. The second set is for the late afternoon. And the final set is before you go to bed. So you can get any type of journal you can use just a plain piece of paper, a little binder, or some fancy journal, or you can do it on your computer. It doesn't matter how you do it. What matters is that you do this every day. All I'm asking is that you do it for one week. Just give it a week. And then after that week, I want to know if it helped you. I already know the answer, but I thought at least I'll act like you can... Surprise me. Maybe you will surprise me. Here's the thing. If you lie doing this, you are condemning yourself. Don't lie. This record is only for you to learn about yourself. Take advantage of it. Regarding the spiritual diary, this is a very common exercise in pretty much every tradition, some type of diary that's used. But specifically, this approach is something that I feel gratitude towards Swami Shivananda, who emphasized this. And he stated about it. He said, this spiritual diary will become more precious to you than your own parents. Because while your parents gave you physical life, they gave you a body, this spiritual diary will give you spiritual life. This spiritual diary can reveal to you your reality if you use it. That's a very powerful statement. So the spiritual diary is something that that has to be maintained on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be a big deal. You don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But if you go through and answer the questions honestly, I'm telling you, in a short period of time, you will know without any question where you are in your spiritual work and why. Don't we all want to know that? When we come to spirituality, don't we want to know what stage we're at in our spiritual work? Of course we do. And we need to know that. If we don't know that, we're wasting our time. We need to be conscious of ourselves, to know ourselves. And if we claim to be spiritual people, we should know our spiritual life more than anything else. But the sad thing is, most so-called spiritual people have the most vague statements they make about their spiritual life. They can't speak in facts. And it shouldn't be like that. Especially if you're a Gnostic student. A Gnostic student knows we only deal in facts. So in your diary, only facts. Do not speculate. Do not guess. Do not be vague. 
Do not imagine. Do not extrapolate. Only record the facts of what has happened. Observable facts. Or facts driv derived by inference. You have to rely on that explanation of the uh, vritis. Okay? That's your exercise, your task for the next week. Any questions? Great question. Right. Okay. So chastity has a very specific definition. In this, in the yoga uh, presentation, the term is brahmacharya, which implies purity, because the word brahma is there, the word of God, name of God. So by brahmacharya, what is implied is in levels. In traditional religion, the beginners always come into the religion and they learn to withhold the sexual energy and to refrain from sexual interaction. They call that celibacy. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is learning to restrain that energy and not expel it from the body. So whether one has a sexual relationship or not, that's irrelevant. What is relevant is that one is restraining the energy and transforming it inside, no longer indulging in the orgasm. But instead of experiencing that brief physical pleasure, we transform that to have spiritual nourishment. That's the real meaning of brahmacharya. That is exactly it. It's a type of tantra. And the, the basis of that is to transform the impurities and make them pure. And we have, if you want to know more about that, there's a bunch of books over there that can explain specifically the perfect matrimony. Talks all about it. Question in the back. Yeah, um, earlier when you were talking, I was like, you were using an analogy. I'd like to talk about that. Yes, now. Yeah. No, the flame does know. The flame is the flame, but it doesn't think. It doesn't have to think it's the flame. And I was thinking about that in reference to like, uh, like what you were talking about as far as perception. It was like, originally I was kind of confused because I was thinking about consciousness is, if it translates, like our, our mind translates everything that we experience in life, and then I guess it brings it back to consciousness. So like, how, like what's that process of knowing It's a great question. Yeah, I understand. It's, it has to do with consciousness, as you say. Consciousness itself sees through the senses, but it is not the senses. It sees through the mind, through the body, through the tongue, through the nose, through the eyes, through the skin. But it is not any of those things. When we perceive something, it requires consciousness. So we say consciousness is perception. But there are many levels of perception. In us, our perception is filtered. It's filtered by the senses and it's filtered by the psyche. It is possible through development, through strengthening the consciousness, to learn to see without any filter. And that is to have accurate, objective perception. It is to see the reality. So in that case, you are the flame. You don't have to think you're the flame. You don't have to interpret what that means. You don't have to interpret the perception. You are that. That is to be. That's the state of being. And that's really the ultimate point of any real spiritual development. It is to develop that ability so that you have it all the time. To see without filters. So thoughts may happen. Feelings may happen. Sensations may happen. But the consciousness is perceiving and not confused by all those layers. It sees right through them. It's really interesting. It's very scientific. And the process of learning to observe yourself in, 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 uh, accompanied by the process of learning to meditate, you strengthen that ability. Gradually, if you learn to extract consciousness from the body, from the senses, from feeling, from thought, you can see and experience what it is to be consciousness. And we call that samadhi. That's the final step of the stages of yoga. Samadhi is that experience. Seeing without any filter. To be. And that can be in your physical body or out of your physical body. So, along with that, so we have this tradition of the 
all in anger. Um, you hear Sabinius coming down into matter to experience matter to then ascend back up. Mm-hmm. So, the, so that experience, experiencing the flame, I'm, I'm assuming that we first have to experience the corpus of matter or in order to awaken to that, we, we have to you know, come down into this matter and experience this as our flame. What, have, how did, how did, you know, what, what's the shortcut rather than the kind of trap that one would like to play in the world? We're already trapped in it, so there's no shortcut simply stated. We're already in the mess. The, uh, the sort of existential question there is, why is it this way and does it have to be this way? And no, it doesn't have to be this way. This is the karma of this particular scenario, that it is this way. But in speaking in general terms, when the great breath unfolds itself into manifestation, it does it to acquire self-knowledge. But that doesn't have to reach the state that we've reached here. And in many world systems, the scriptures say that that doesn't happen that way. Beings don't enter into the state of degeneration that we have. This is a unique circumstance that's extraordinarily painful for all the beings here. Uh, and it's just a consequence of wrong actions, mistaken actions. So there's no shortcut. But the good thing is there is a path out. And it's the same universal path, but it has to be applied with a great deal of energy. You know, in other, in other systems, in other scenarios, the path is more easily realized because the karma is not so heavy. For, he, for us here, the karma is extremely heavy, which requires a different application of energy to transform it. it makes sense, right? Just in terms of how the physics of it works. But nevertheless, it can be done. We just need the lever to move the universe. And that lever is inside of us. Yeah. So would you say that the self is just awareness? The self. The self. What is that, really? What is that? So the self it, itself. I mean, it's just crazy. I, 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 want, I want to know the self is our thought. How would you? Through perception. The real self, what is that? It's a great question because the, the thing that I asked you to do for your exercise is to ask, what is this that I observe? Is it myself? The question implies the answer. Who is perceiving? Who is the perceiver? That's where you need to look for the answer. So how am I asking? How am I perceiving? In this moment, who is asking? And what qualities does that who have? So this is a process of, you could say, a philosophical inquiry. This is the way it's usually treated. But it actually is a very practical inquiry that we learn to work with constantly in this tradition. And that is to always be asking that question, who is this? What of this is practical and real? What of this can I confirm? What is this experience? So looking outward, you won't get any answers because you only see things that are constantly changing. Nothing in your external perception is inherently reliable, right? Everything that's happening outside is constantly changing and you can't do anything about it. Everything that you perceive is going to go away. Everything. Even the physical body. Even those you love. All of them will go away. Every relationship, every situation, every scenario will go away. What remains constant? Perception. Self. So on that note, we have to look at the tree of life. Where is perception? Hard to answer that, isn't it? No, I'm saying here and now, look into yourself 
And knowing what you know about the tree of life, answer that. Where is my perception coming from? It really requires that you sink inside, right? You have to look in because you can't look out. You have to look in, keep looking in, looking in, looking in. And if you persist in that inward inquiry, you will be forced to make certain steps. They include realizing that it is not the physical body that is seeing because you can still perceive when you are not in your physical body. Any spiritual person can confirm that if they know how to work spiritually because you know how to be awake in your dreams or to get out of your body, whether in meditation or at night. You've had experiences, maybe by will or maybe by accident, where you know you were perceiving but not in your physical body. So then who was perceiving? That inquiry, constantly maintained, leads one up the tree of life, not down. And this is the critical point. Right now as we are, we're in our physical bodies, but we are constantly perceiving through all these filters in the subconsciousness. We feel afraid, we feel doubt, we feel worry. Those filter our perception, and we think we are that. But when we ask the question, is this myself? Is this where my perception originates? You're forced to realize that it is not. Your anger sees, but what gives the ability of that anger to see? It's consciousness. The consciousness is trapped in the anger, but it is not the anger. You following what I'm saying? That line of inquiry takes you deep, 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 past the filters, past the body, past the vital body, past the astral body, deeper and deeper. I mean, for instance, like, I, I know that I show up here and that I have a desire to seek out spiritual truth yeah. through logical inference and, you know, also through rigorous, you know, experience. I also know that there are certain emotions that have conditioned me and trauma in my life when I was younger that likely predisposed me to do such things, right? Sure. To do, to desire, to seek truth in a spiritual fashion and to perceive metaphysical reality in a certain way. So is that, but... I can say that also about my desire to have an advanced degree somewhere, something like that, which is not something that's necessarily evil or wrong or uh, an avarice. Uh, so, you know, my, but when I think about my desire to seek out the spirituality, is that my spiritual self or is that still somehow lodged in the physical frame or of my life in the you know, mechanism, the biological mechanism? You know what I'm saying? The only way you can ever answer that question is to. Dive within it in yourself in the moment. Not with the intellect, but to sit still, quiet, withdraw from your senses, and bring up that inquiry and look into the heart of that inquiry, inside. To look where is the inquiry coming from and follow it back inside. This is not an intellectual exercise. It's a perceptive exercise. It, is, it doesn't make sense when I explain it in words. It's an actual way to sit and meditate This is, but this is what I'm explaining. When you try to find the answer in memory or in supposition or in possibilities, it's only guesswork. You can't answer that way. That's the intellect. And that's what I was explaining. That's a vritti called wrong perception. It's how the mind tries to, maybe it was this and maybe it was that, but it's not based on a real perception of something that you experienced. The way you find that is through meditation. Yeah, it cycles through hypotheses. Hypotheses are just that, but they have to be proven. So we take a scientific approach. Let me explain this in a simple way for you. Through meditation, one can learn to sift your memories and see what was real in them. You can learn to look back at your past and recover what actually happened and look at the facts of that thing rather than what your mind tells you happened. 
When you develop consciousness, it has the ability to perceive the facts physically or in the internal worlds. And that means if you follow the process I explained where you look into that inquiry and you extract yourself from the physical body and you extract yourself from your energetic body and from your emotional and intellectual and just become that pure perception in a state of meditation, you can learn to perceive the images reflected in any of these dimensions. This includes the memories of the past. So rather than seeing those memories through the filters of your personality and your traumas, you see them like a scientist or detective who sees them for what they are. Then you can know. Why is this this way? Why is that this way? You know. Let me give you an example. Recently, I was meditating on a troubling emotion. And it was bothering me a lot. And my logic could not find the answer. I couldn't find it through inference. I couldn't find it through testimony in the scripture. So I was trying to use right knowledge. And I couldn't find it through direct perception. And I knew that if I just relied on my own sort of theoretical explanation or whatever, it would just be a subjective guess. So I was meditating, trying to meditate on that actual experience, concentrating on the emotion, meditating on the emotion, extracting my attention from everything else. And then I had this experience. I captured and recovered a memory from when I was a little child. And something happened in my house that caused a reaction to me emotionally that's still affecting me today. It was an undigested impression. That as a child, I wasn't equipped to deal with it. And when I came out of that meditation, I felt completely different because I understood it. I knew it. I didn't have to think about it. That's the difference, right? Knowing that you're the flame or thinking, like having the right knowledge, I had that. But more than that, I knew it. I didn't have to think about it. That was a, a way of acquiring gnosis about that experience. So I was able to see how the present emotion was rooted in a past experience. This just happened. It was nice that I was able to explain it for, for you. That's how that works. And the reason I learned that is from this tradition. Knowing I am not the body. I am not the energy. I am not emotion. I am not intellect. I'm Arjuna. My own Arjuna, consciousness, human soul. I know how to experience that. I know how to access that because I learned it here. And that has given me that ability, which is the most precious thing I have. That's why I'm explaining it to you. It can be done, but to do it, you have to shut this off. Theorizing, guessing. That's why this diary is so important. To start training yourself to only look at observable facts. And along the way, find the proof of who you really are, self-knowledge. The proof of who you are in divinity and humanity and in purity. No guesswork. You have to be able to clearly identify these things in yourself in the moment. Not to explain it to someone else, but to be able to identify them and recognize them. Did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, it just seems to me that like, awareness in itself is empty. It is, exactly. Padmasambhava gave very beautiful teachings about that. He explained in, there's a text that in English is called Natural Liberation Through the Introduction to Awareness. I don't remember the Tibetan name. It's, my Tibetan's terrible. But um, in that text, he explains that. Study it. We have a lecture about it on our website, and you can find that text in a lot of places. What he explains there is simply that when you look into awareness, you can't find anything, but it is there. That's the self. That is the self. You, now, in Buddhism, you don't use that term self. They use the term tathagatagarbha, which means the Buddha nature. It's that nature of mind, the, the true nature that we all have. The reason that we don't like to use the word self in that tradition is because self implies something that has a, um, like a body, like some material aspect. People always think self, and they imagine that my self must be this bearded guy in some other dimension. 
Atman. And that exists, but that is not the ultimate explanation of self-nature, what, what our true nature is. So, so does it, then it can't, I mean, you can't have attention in itself. It has to be attention of something, right? No, it can be just attention, just awareness. So what would it be aware of? Itself. Awareness naturally has a presence. That is its primordial state. It doesn't have to be directed out at any other thing. It is just simple recognition. I am. In Sanskrit, that's soham. So it is that. And that's related ultimately to how the absolute is and is not. So to remember yourself is kind of to be a perfect reflection of what is in the moment? It is to be. In being, there doesn't have to be any thought. It is just beingness. And the intellect will never grasp that because the intellect only compares. The intellect it completely depends on A and B. Observer observed. The intellect cannot comprehend beingness, which is a state of unity, oneness. So then if you ask that question, is this um, emotion or is this, I forget the exact phrase, you said, is this observable thing myself, wouldn't the answer always be no? Yes. Because <laughs> if it's observable, that means that it's that's an entity. Exactly. But it also implies the question, who is observing? That's the value of it. You have to experience that distinction constantly. because We don't. We're always going through everything, feeling like, this is me, and I'm doing this thing, and I'm thinking this, and I'm feeling this, and that's all a lie. And this is something explained in the Gita, but it's very difficult to understand it, the way it's written there. It's explained... But if you don't meditate, you can't understand what Krishna is explaining. He's explaining that about the watcher and how the watcher is related with our purusha, our atman, our innermost. And it's very, a lot of people fall into confusion, especially also related with Advaita, which is the philosophical branch of Hinduism. And they think that that I am is me here and now. And that's absolutely dead wrong. All right. Emptiness is also a type of perception, right? Yep. It's a beingness, which implies perception. So the, the emptiness is a real perception. The ultimate perception. No perception. So any, anything that is a thing is not the self. Is outside of that. So basically anything that happens is not the self. The only thing that the self is is Exactly. This is, that is the crux of the heart of Hindu and Buddhist philosophy. Exactly that question. And that's why there's so many schools in these different traditions that approach that question in different ways. And all of them have validity. All of them point out certain aspects of that perception that are valid. But you can't, philosoph you know, you can't uh, debate about it philosophically. It has to be experienced to be understood. It's so far beyond the mind. Let's put this in perspective. We'll look at the, at the tree of life again. Here's our physical body. So all of us are here in our physical bodies. This is the, the energy in that body, the emotion, the mind. Look how far that is from the absolute. And even here physically, we're only hazily aware of thinking because we don't actively observe it. It's just happening we just kind of go along and the things, thinking's happening and the feelings are happening, but it's so subtle to our perception. Compare that with trying to comprehend the causal body, the buddhic body, the atomic body, and the trikaya of the Buddha. Much more subtle. They are here with us. All of us have all those subtleties, but we don't have the perception strengthened enough to see them, to know them even though they're there. So the questions you're asking point towards that because that's where the root of perception lies. 
the heart of all existing things is that ray of light that comes out of the absolute, which we call Christ, Krishna. And it's that fire that gives everything the, the potential to be. It itself is that root of perception. But we are so far from comprehending that because we're so dense in these low levels. So we have to become much more subtle in how our perception works. And then you can perceive it. But it requires a lot of development. I mean, I, I perceive my thought and I remove it at a, a very intense level. So to, to watch that, I do perceive it as another part of my brain, perhaps. I don't know. But I perceive it as someone that is watching it to detect it. That's, that's sure. Like, I mean, yeah, I detect the thoughts. I've been able to undo certain habits by watching the thoughts occur, see the feelings. And I feel like, yes, it's a separate self that is, is watching myself do these things. But is that watcher someone that needs to be watched, or is that myself? That's something that depends on the process of your development. It's possible to become a watcher of thoughts, but strictly within that intellectual sphere. Exactly. That's what I kind of feel like. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Okay. So the, the true, the, the more effective way, we'll put it this way, the more effective way to learn to watch thoughts is from a distance. Not being in them, but seeing them as something foreign. To watch them without analysis. Does that make sense? Now, what I'm pointing at is this. When we study the tree of life, this is how we look at it. Physical body, energy in the body, emotion, thought. But this is concrete thought. These are thoughts that have some psychological structure. I am really hoping I get to watch that game. Thought. That's a concrete type of thought related with intellect. More subtle is abstract thought, which isn't concrete in that form. That abstract level of mind can see the concrete level. But there's more than that. There's also buddhi, which is where the consciousness really is first showing itself in, the, in this process of unfoldment. That, it's, it is, it is uh, in Sanskrit it's called buddhi, which roughly translates as mind, but it really implies a type of um, cognizant perception that is thoughtless. That's even more abstract. We, we, we all have all of these. There's a third place, the third place that you're talking about. It's even, yeah, it's even more abstract than the abstract thought. Perception, yeah, it's objective. It's not conditioned or filtered at all. You see, from here, from the causal body, Tiferet, downwards, all of that in us is conditioned by our karma, by the psyche that we have. And that's why whatever we perceive in those levels is flawed and cannot be trusted. Meditation is the key. When you learn to extract attention from all of these conditioned levels and perceive from buddhi, which is the Sephirah Geberah, you see without conditions, without filters. You see objectively. You see the reality. That's where we all want to go. Exactly. Exactly. And to do that is possible for anyone. But we need energy. The consciousness needs a lot of energy. That's why we save the sexual energy. That energy directly fuels the development of the consciousness. That energy saturates the entire psyche when we save it. When we restrain that energy, we transform that energy, it nourishes the body, it nourishes the vital body, it nourishes the emotional body, it nourishes the intellectual body, but most of all, it nourishes the consciousness. It inflames the consciousness. That's the very power that we need to transform the mind. The people who don't save that energy 
are like Tantalus from the Greek myth, or they're like um, someone who's constantly failing to achieve what they're trying to achieve. They, they know it can be done. They see the way to do it, but they don't realize that they are their own worst enemy. So the, the chief way is to energize the consciousness. Now, all the things that I explained in the lecture about yama and niyama are really also the same thing. When we stop harmful behaviors, for example, ahimsa, the first one, when you produce harm for yourself or others, you expend energy to do that, and you produce a consequence, which is harmful. When you restrain yourself and you don't produce harm, but you produce something loving and compassionate for someone else, you use that energy in a higher way. That energy is transformed. It produces a good result. That nourishes the consciousness rather than conditioning it. You see the difference? Ahimsa, harmful action, conditions the consciousness with more karma. Himsa, loving action, liberates the consciousness and gives it energy. So this is true of all those 10 steps. And one of those is brahmacharya. When you conserve the sexual energy and not utilize it through desire, that very powerful energy, instead of conditioning the consciousness with lust, liberates the consciousness from lust. And all that energy is then available for the consciousness to use it for good. And the chief way is through self-knowledge. So where the mind and the heart and the body were depleted by the previous waste of the energy, they now become energized and saturated with rejuvenating energy that give you more ability to perceive deeper and deeper. Yeah. One hopes. Hmm? One hopes that it's beyond the defect, but there's no guarantee. Unless you're confirmed and know for a fact that you're in a state of samadhi, you have to assume that there are filters. But if you're aware of the emotional body, what could be the filter between the consciousness and the emotional body? You can be very aware that you're angry and still act on anger. But not aware of it as in watching it. Same. I can be very aware that I'm mad at you and I can punch you <laughs> and be aware of it. You know what I'm saying? She knows exactly what I'm talking about. But that's not real awareness, right? Yes, it is. Of course it's awareness. That is the consciousness that's trapped in that anger. Yes. That is to be awake negatively. And we all do it. You have to start where you are. Observe yourself and seek always to liberate the perception from all its filters. And in our state, that's not easy. That's why meditation is so important. Really. But that can only come once you've worked through those other stages of yoga. You have to start liberating perception from all the things that are happening all day long before meditation becomes a reality for you. And it means, quite frankly, that in the first years, you're just in the battlefield, never knowing. You know, for sure, is this objective what I'm seeing and experiencing? You have to just say, no, it isn't, because I'm not awake. I'm not in samadhi. I'm not in a state in which I can confirm 100% that I'm seeing objectively. Because in that scripture, why does Padma Sambhava mention ordinary? He says ordinary awareness. He's talking about ordinary awareness that is unfiltered. Which you can experience in this moment. If you have no conditioning factors afflicting you at this instant, that ordinary awareness is similar to a samadhi in the sense that it is not filtered by any defect. It's filtered by the body. It's filtered by the senses. But if you are cognizant of those things, then you can see something more or less objectively. Maybe not with a penetrating insight, but without a filter. The problem is, 
that our personality and our senses have hypnotized us so deeply, especially in the type of lifestyle that we have now where we're constantly running from thing to thing, it's very difficult to have an experience of even ordinary awareness. Well, you almost feel like you're, you're not being responsible if you're not like, right. doing something with it. You just feel like you're pretty bad at it. Like, well, I probably just need to do it. Exactly right. So let me ask you something. If I said, let's all just go to the field and hang out there for eight hours and not do anything. It sounds like hell, right? Like, oh my God, eight hours sitting in the grass doing nothing? N nobody here would agree to that. But in that experience of going, in that experience of going there and not having anything, you will experience ordinary awareness. Just being. Don't have to go anywhere. Don't have to do anything. No boss, no spouse, no kids, no TV, no internet, no cell phone, no nothing. And free of all those conditions, one can experience ordinary awareness. And that can be more or less objective. That's what I'm pointing at. So when you, get, so when you develop this type of awareness and you develop, is there, where do you um, cultivate this type of energy that are greater to the level necessary for that liberation? Will you also then find a, a purpose, a divine purpose? Like, or yes. Like something that's already found. Or will you find, because I've always felt that there's a purpose that I'm not found. Yes. And, and that's the driving force that is bothering me. Yes. Bothering me. You will, undoubtedly. Okay. We all have a purpose. And when you have a spiritual, we, we call this a spiritual inquietude. Yeah, right. We, have, we call this a spiritual inquietude. It's that urgency to discover spirituality. And, and we know, we sense there's something there. That comes from your being, your innermost, your divine mother. That divinity in you is pushing you that way in your heart. That's why you have that urgency. Absolutely. The first purpose is to realize that and then act on it. And in the process of the work, Gradually, little by little, you find more to that purpose. How you can reflect the light of that divinity through your daily activities. Yeah, the, 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 physical, the physical aspect. That's right. And the first ways we do that is by acting on those 10 steps in our daily lives. Being truthful, being loving, being compassionate, not lying, not stealing. All of those 10 yama and niyama, those aspects. When we act on those... We immediately open ourselves to our being guiding us to our purpose. So, so, so the, the last thing I want to say is that, you know, you didn't, you didn't really mean when you said, okay, we have a job that we hate, right? And we, let's say we, go in and we, we do love everyone, and we, we, but we really just we are not, we don't like what the job is. We don't like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, you probably shouldn't stay in there and suffer in the job forever because that's probably not a purpose if you honestly just don't like it, even though you do come in with a loving heart. Sure. Well, one of those aspects that I mentioned is tapas, which is part of niyama. Tapas means penances. And in this tradition, we learned that when we really dedicate ourselves to our spiritual development, we have to put all of our longings into the hands of our innermost and say, well, I really don't like my circumstances in my life, but thy will be done. And that's why Jesus prays, Father, take this cup from me, but thy will be done. So in that sense, we say, yeah, I don't like my job, or I don't like my house, or I don't like the city I live in, but I'm going to do what you guide me to do. I'm going to, I'm going to take the circumstances you give me and do my best with them. And the reason we approach it that way is because we know something about psychology and karma, and that is this. Our external circumstances are simply a reflection of our internal circumstances. When we change inside, everything outside changes. So where we are physically is because we belong there. Because we have, by karma, by our own action, put ourselves in that position. So if we adopt superior action, better ways of behaving, better ways of being, everything outside of us changes automatically. But you see how we in modern life do it the opposite? Yeah. Nothing's forever. So no, it's not like it's not 
not about that. It's like you can be dissatisfied with to know that changing your inside will change the outside. It does, inevitably. So it's not that we should sit there and think we're tenants for the rest of our lives in this job so we're just going to sit there and right. take it. It's unrealistic because nothing lasts forever. But if we take our attention and turn it inside, definitely good will come of it. If we focus our attention on the outside, we can't say that. We can't say good will always come of it. Not at all. No, it doesn't mean hands off, I'm not going to do anything. It means hands on, I'm going to do my best with what you've given me, but please give me something better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We could take action, though, intuitively, if we felt like we had to take action. Absolutely. We have to act. Like they say, pray to catch the bus, but run fast. <laughs> To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. <laughs>